Asanteni sana kwa kuwa pamoja nasi kwenye uhusiano wa imani. Obrigado por sintonizar a Conexão da Fé. Gracias por sintonizarnos en la Conexión de Fe. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection, where we help you connect to God. Hi, I'm Steve Hobbins, pastor of Lewis Avenue Baptist Church in Temperance, Michigan. I want to share something from God's Word with you today from Matthew chapter 26, dealing with the life of Peter. In Matthew chapter 26, when Jesus is telling the apostles that he is getting ready to die, and uh, he's getting, he tells Peter what's going to happen to Peter, and Peter, uh, he has a hard time listening. And verse 31 of Matthew chapter 26, Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Jesus tells the disciples that he is going to die, that, that, but he also tells them they're going to be offended at him. And he says that after I'm risen, I'm going to go into Galilee, but uh, they were stuck on the I'm going to die part, and uh, Peter gets caught up with the offended part. And all the disciples missed the fact that Jesus said, I'm going to resurrect. And we know this because after the resurrection, they weren't expecting at all. They missed what he said. He plainly told them this. But Peter begins to speak up when he said, all of you shall offend me. He didn't single Peter out. He says, that unto, Jesus said unto them, all ye shall be offended. But Peter speaks up. In verse 33, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. That's three times. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. So the other disciples are speaking up. It seems that Peter is the spokesman here and they follow uh, his lead on this. But Peter is confident that he is not going to let the Lord down. And this is a situation here that is a good uh, picture, a good illustration of when we are overconfident. And I, I want you to look at these passages with me. Uh, Matthew 26, you see Mark 14, Luke 22, John 13. All these passages deal with this truth. What do we do when our overconfidence is out of control? Or what situations cause us? How do we get into the place where our overconfidence is out of control? Peter is totally overconfident. And we know from the gospel story that Peter denies Christ. But here he's saying, I will never do it. If everybody does it, I will not do it. He's confident, but he's overconfident. And it's out of control. And his overconfidence led to a fall. So I want you to see from this passage of how, what leads to overconfidence. First of all, I am overconfident to the degree that I am self-confident. It's not wrong to be confident. What's wrong is to be confident in myself instead of confident in Christ. Notice in the passage in verse 33, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. I won't. He was confident, overconfident, because he was confident in self. Verse 35, two verses later says, Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise said all the disciples. They all said, We are not going to deny you. Luke's part of it, Luke, when Luke shows us this story in verse 33 of Luke 22, and he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee. I am ready. In other words, we see the confidence here with Peter, but it's a false confidence, an overconfidence that led to failure. Remember, the Bible said, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Peter's pride here, his overconfidence led to a fall. Why was he overconfident? Because he was confident in self. Listen, it's impossible to be overconfident in Christ because he never lets us down. So therefore, if I am overconfident, my confidence must be in self because it can't, I can't be overconfident being confident in Christ. And it's possible for me to think I have things under control. I'm not going to deny the Lord. I'm not going to fall get victim to this sin or that sin. I've got victory over this. And when we feel that, when we're saying I, 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 we're in trouble because I, the flesh, lets people down, lets God down. 
rather God wants us to be confident <clears throat> in him and his ability. But when I'm confident in my ability, when I think I have what it takes to hold my marriage together, when I have what it takes to be a good father, when I have what it takes to live the Christian life, I am overconfident and I set myself up for a fall because God never intended for us to be uh, self-confident. I want you to notice this as well. I am overconfident when I see myself as exceptional. When I see myself... Everybody else, did you notice what Peter said there? Though all shall be offended. Boy, what a friend Peter is. Can you imagine that? Uh, Peter, uh, he's, the other apostles are thinking, hey, why did you say that about us, Peter? Though all these guys be offended, I will never. See, Peter saw himself as exceptional. He saw himself as a cut above everybody else. And when we see ourselves as better than other people, our self-confidence overconfidence sets us up for trouble. We know what happens at the end of this. Peter fails. He denies the Lord. In Mark's version, Peter said in him, although all shall be offended, yet will not I, I'll never. He saw himself as exceptional. When we get to the point where we think we cannot fail the Lord, everybody else might, but I never will. We have set ourselves up for a fall. I have to remember that I am capable of any sin, that I, it's possible for me to, to sin, to fall into sin, to let God down, to do anything because my flesh fails me. My flesh does not want to please God. I want to please God, but my flesh doesn't. One day when Jesus Christ returns, I can't wait for that day because I'm going to have my, what the Bible calls glorification. I'm going to have my glorified body. I'm going to be sinless. But in the meantime, I live in sinful flesh. And though my spirit indeed is willing to please the Lord, I have a constant battle fighting against my flesh. One of our three enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So I am overconfident to the degree that I am confident in self. I am overconfident to uh, when I see myself as exceptional. But I also want you to notice this. I am overconfident when I see myself as invulnerable. In other words, when I think there's no way I can fail, I'm better than everybody else, that's seeing myself as exceptional. I will never, I cannot, it's impossible. Peter used the term, I will never fail you. I will never deny you. And he did, but he said never. See, he saw himself as invulnerable. You know, many good, godly men have made the mistake of thinking that they have reached a point in their Christian life, and they're men that love the Lord, no doubt, but thinking, I don't need safeguards in my life. I don't need to be careful. I don't need to take precaution. I have reached a point where my flesh can't get the victory. They are seeing themselves as invulnerable. They are seeing themselves, they're saying about themselves, I will never fail the Lord. You know, I had a Dear preacher friend that invested a lot in me when I was a young preacher, and I appreciate him to this day. And he fell into sin. It broke my heart. My wife and I were talking about it, and obviously this person was close to me. And uh, I told her, I said, Angie, I will never do that to you. I said, but what scares me is that man said the same thing to his wife and thought the same thing, that I will never let, it, let, it, let God down. I will never let my wife down. I like to believe that, that I will never fail my wife. But I know I'm capable of it. And so therefore, I'm careful to make sure I cultivate that relationship, to make sure I pay attention to that relationship, to make sure I feed and develop the relationship, both the relationship with my wife because I love her, but also the same thing applies to the Lord. I know that it's possible for me to turn my back on him and fail him. I can't imagine it, but neither could Peter. In fact, Peter used the term never. I will never fail you. I will never deny you. And we know that he did. I am overconfident when I think I can't fall, when I see myself as invulnerable. I want you to notice next, I am overconfident when I feel the need to exaggerate my sincerity. Peter said in verse 35, though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Jesus 
said that you're going to deny me. And Peter went further. He exaggerated it. He said, though I would die with you, I will not deny you. You know, it's, it's easy for us to exaggerate our sincerity. When someone has to exaggerate like that, when they, when they have to uh, make a point by, by making promises and going even further, you say I would deny you? Even if I died for you, I would not deny you. Well, Peter did end up deny, or dying for the Lord. But in the meantime, he didn't die for him. A little servant girl came to him and he said, I don't even know him. In fact, he did it three times. Why? Well, because Peter was overconfident. He thought his confidence, uh, he thought he could do it himself. His confidence was in, the, in himself, not in God. He thought he was exceptional. I'm better than everybody else. I won't do it even if they all do. And he thought he was invulnerable. I will never do it. In fact, he felt the need to exaggerate it. I would die for you. Now, I, don't miss in all of this the genuine heart of Peter. And I believe this is where it's coming from. I don't think Peter had in his mind, I'm going to deny the Lord. I think Peter genuinely thought, I will not deny him. It's not going to happen. And he really meant it. But the point is, we become overconfident. And when we're overconfident, we deceive ourselves, we fool ourselves, and we don't know how vulnerable we are. We don't know uh, how we can fall. We can fail the Lord. He felt the need to exaggerate his sincerity, uh, much like the Pharisees did in Jesus' day. When, when they exaggerated everything they did and how sincere they were, how much they loved the Lord, and yet they were turning people away from the Lord while they were doing that. We have to be careful about that. I, I want to have a heart like Peter that has that, uh, that really thinks, there's no way. I love him. I would die for him. I like that. But at the same time, I have to be careful because if I place my confidence in self, if I have to exaggerate my sincerity, I'm setting myself up for a fall. And that's a dangerous thing. I want you to notice also, I am overconfident when I am unrealistic about my weakness. Notice what Jesus says. You see the words there, sheep and wheat. Those aren't very strong things. In Matthew 26, 31, Then Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. How did Peter see himself? He saw himself as a mighty warrior. In fact, when they came for Christ, he pulled out his sword and he went to chopping heads. He was trying to kill people. He ended up cutting Malchus's ear off. He, Peter saw himself as a warrior. Jesus saw him as a sheep. He said, smite the shepherd, Jesus, and the sheep will be scattered. He wasn't realistic about his weakness. In Luke, Luke's account, in verse, chapter 22, verse 31, he said to Peter, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Peter saw himself as a, a warrior, as a soldier for Christ. And, and I'm sure he meant that. And, and I, the Lord knows his, his heart that he, he meant it. But the Lord also was trying to tell him, you're going to fail. In fact, that's what starts this whole thing. Jesus is telling the apostles, you are going to fail. And Peter speaks up and says, no way. He see his overconfidence. And his overconfidence resulted in him being unrealistic about his weakness. He did not see his flesh as a sheep. He did not see himself as wheat. He saw himself in, as though he couldn't fail. We have to be realistic about our weaknesses. Do you know it's okay to be realistic about where you're weak? It's okay for you to know your strengths. Some of you may be good singers. And if somebody came up to you and said, wow, you're a good singer, you would say, oh, no, I'm not. Well, yes, you are. You, it's okay to acknowledge that. It's wrong to make it a matter of pride and think that makes you better than somebody else. It does not. But it's okay to acknowledge your strengths because when you acknowledge your strengths, you can give them to Jesus and use them for him. Why do I bring up your strengths? Because the same truth is here about our weaknesses. When we realize, boy, I'm not very good at this, or this is a place where, where, that is dangerous, this is a place where, where I am vulnerable, uh, somebody who sees their weaknesses and knows their weaknesses <clears throat> will stay away from their weaknesses, won't even go near it. 
someone who struggles with alcohol is not going to go near alcohol <coughs> if they are realistic about their weakness. I don't mean they're not going to drink it. I mean, they're not even going to put themselves around it. Why? Because they know their weakness. Someone who struggles with lust is not going to put himself in a place that will cause lustful thoughts. What is that? That's being realistic about our weakness. And Peter wasn't. He saw himself, I will die for you. And Jesus said, Peter, you're a sheep. And uh, Peter had to learn the hard way that he was going to deny the Lord. But the Lord was trying to tell him. He tries to tell us, doesn't he? That's why we have his word. In fact, notice in his word next, number six, I am overconfident when I ignore the depths to which I can fall. When I don't think, when I think, well, I might fall, I might stumble, but never this far. Well, think how far Peter fell, but he didn't think he could fall at all. And the verse on the screen there, Mark 14, 30, I'll refer to that one. The Bible says, and Jesus saith unto him, verily I say unto thee that this day, even in this night, not, you're not just going to deny me, you're going to do it tonight. Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter, not only are you going to deny me, you're going to deny me tonight and you're going to do it three times before the morning even comes. Peter was overconfident because he ignored the depths to which he could fall. If, if you are shocked at the depths of sin that you have in your life or that you've, been, you've got things in your past that you are ashamed of, if you're uh, disappointed in that, you, you haven't been realistic about the depth to which you can fall. Certainly there's, there's shame there, but God forgives and he knew what you were capable of. Uh, it's also mentioned in Luke twenty two thirty four, And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow thee this day before that thou shalt deny. He doesn't just say you're going to deny me. The deny that thou knowest me. You're going to deny me, Peter. And not only are you going to deny me, you're going to do it tonight. You're going to do it three times before the morning. And you're going to deny not just me. You're going to deny that you even know me. Peter wasn't realistic about the depths to which he was capable of falling. And that is part of what led to his fall. Let me ask you, do you want to fall? Do you want to deny Christ? I don't. I would hope you don't either. Well, then we better be realistic about what the depths to which we can fall. And we better be careful about judging other people who have fallen into sin. When we do that and we are judging them and we are looking down on them, I can't believe how disgusting that they fell that far. You better be careful. Because you're not being honest about what you're capable of. Mark this down. I am a pastor. I am the son of a pastor. I'm a child of God. I'm a servant of God. But there is not any sin that I am incapable of. I am being realistic about the depths to which I can fall. Now, I hope I don't fall at all. I hope I never sin. But I do. I let the Lord down. I, I, I choose to obey the flesh instead of the Lord often, and I have to get that right with him. But don't let the mistake be because you haven't been realistic about the depths to which you can fall. Notice, I'm overconfident when I argue rather than examine when I'm confronted. Mark 14, verse 31, uh, but he spake the more vehemently, if I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Likewise also said they all. In other words, when he said in any wise, not on any level. Arguing, when I argue with someone, that means I believe that I am right and they are wrong. And uh, well, frankly, sometimes I am right. I have the facts and frankly, sometimes I am wrong, other people. But if I argue with someone, I am saying that I am right and they are wrong. Okay, but we're talking about Jesus. Jesus said, you're all gonna deny me. Jesus said it. Hasn't Jesus got a track record that Peter can trust? Sure, sure he does. But Peter missed it. And Peter argued instead of examined himself. When Jesus said that, instead of arguing, thinking he was right and Jesus was wrong, he should have examined himself. Do you have a friend, someone close enough that could come to you and say, man, I, I'm, I'm worried about this. Do you know some people, if, if they had a friend come to them, they would be very upset. They would say, who do you think you are to talk to me that way? Who do you think you are to confront me? Who, wait, hold on. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. It's okay for someone to confront me.
to ask me about something. And when they do, I want to examine myself. When somebody says, you did this because of this, they don't know my heart, but I still want to check and examine my heart. I've had people tell me, you did something, and I thought, there's no way. In fact, I still think they were wrong. But I do remember taking time to examine my life and saying, you know what? Uh, this person is really not that close to me. They didn't handle it the right way. But I still need to be willing to examine my life and check up. If Peter would have done that, perhaps he wouldn't have fallen. And imagine the grief and the sorrow, the heartache he could have avoided. I want you to notice next, I am overconfident when I am unaware of my enemy. Now, I mentioned one of our enemies, the flesh, but I'm not talking about that. In Luke's passage, he uses the phrase to Peter. He says, Peter, Satan hath desired you that he may sift you as wheat. Satan is our enemy. Satan hates us. If we do wrong, Satan is not happy. Satan hates us. He's never happy. Even there are people in the world who have dedicated their lives, dedicated themselves to Satan. Does that make him happy? No, he hates them. He's not proud of them. He's not pleased with them. He hates them. He hates everybody. Satan wants to, to, to destroy us. He wants to cause doubts. I was talking with someone who was struggling with their salvation, and, and I believe they're saved. And they were saying, man, I, I just don't know for sure. Well, I said, who do you think's causing that? That's the devil. The devil can't get you unsaved, so he wants you to be miserable while you're saved. He wants you to think you're not saved. Satan is our enemy. The Bible calls him a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. He's like a lion, he's, he hates us. He wants to destroy our lives. You know, see, Peter was overconfident. He was overconfident because he did not properly consider the fact that he has an enemy. That Satan desired to have Peter, not just to hold him captive, not just to trip him up, to sift him, to tear him apart. We miss that. Now, I want you to notice this about our confidence. This, this story, you may think, well, this story shakes my confidence. This story causes me to, to falter. No, it shouldn't shake our confidence. It should shake our confidence in us. This story is not saying we shouldn't have confidence. This story is saying we shouldn't have confidence in us, but we should have confidence in God. And I want you to see this. This is a precious, precious passage, particularly in Luke. Luke focuses on this in verse, chapter 22, verses 31 and 32. I want you to know where our confidence should lie. First of all, I can be confident that Jesus knows my specific individual needs. He says in Luke 22, verse 31, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired you. He calls him by name, calls him by name twice. I think he's making an emphasis here. What he's saying is, Simon, I know you individually. Not just I know what everybody needs, although he does. No, he knows your name. He knows your name. And he calls, in this case, Simon's name. But it's no, not because Simon was more precious to him than you are. He knows your name. You shouldn't be confident in self, but you can be confident in the fact that Jesus knows not just needs in general, but my specific individual needs. He knows what Steve Hobbins needs. I'm so glad that he does. I also want you to notice something else we can be confident in. I can be confident that Jesus knows my enemy better than my enemy knows me. See, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, Satan hath desired you that he may sift you. He knew what Satan wanted, and he knew why Satan wanted it. Jesus knows my enemy. When I told you Satan walks about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, that shouldn't scare you. That should just know that, make, remind you that you need Christ. In fact, here the Bible says, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. In fact, Jesus knew Satan hath desired you. That's what Satan wants, that he may sift you. Peter, I know who wants you, and I know why he wants you. See, even the devil, when he tries to ruin everything, still accomplishes God's will. God, there's not two gods. God the Father, Jehovah God, and Satan. No, there's not two gods. There's one God. Satan is not God. And so God knows Satan better than my enemy 
knows me. In fact, God knows my enemy better than my enemy knows my enemy, better than Satan knows himself. Now, I also want you to see something else I can be confident in. This is great. I can be confident that Jesus is praying for me. Satan, or Peter, uh, Simon, Satan hath desired you that he may sift you as wheat. But then Jesus says, but I have prayed for thee. Wow. <laughs> Think about that. The struggles that we go through. And yet Jesus, the creator, the one who died for me, said, I have prayed for you. You know, when somebody tells you they're praying for you, how encouraging that is. By the way, if you're praying for people, and we ought to, tell them that you've prayed for them. How encouraging is that? But he said, I have prayed for thee. So yes, Satan's coming after, but I want you to know I've prayed for you. That's precious. And notice also another avenue of confidence. I can be confident that Jesus is aware of the fact that I am trying. He said, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Wait a second. He didn't say, I prayed for thee that you have faith. He said, I pray that thy faith fail not. And think about it this way. If he's praying that my faith doesn't fail, that means I have to have faith. In other words, he knows I'm inadequate, but he does know I'm trying. You know, when I fail the Lord, it breaks my heart. But I am glad that he knows I'm trying. I'm glad that he knows, Lord, I let you down, but I don't want to let you down. I'm sorry I let you down. And he knows, I, I know you're trying. I know you love me but I also know your enemy. I also know what you're made of. And I get to know that he's been praying for me. How wonderful. And that not only that, I can be confident that Jesus can help me recover personally. This is great. He said, I've prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted. In other words, you are going to fail. <laughs> Do you ever feel discouraged because you don't have your prayers answered? Jesus told Peter, I prayed that your faith wouldn't fail, but you're going to fail. Wow. Jesus didn't get his prayer answered there. Well, he did because he wasn't praying that Peter wouldn't fail. He was praying for Peter through it. And, uh, uh, but when thou art converted, Jesus says, I know you're going to come back, Simon. I know you're going to be converted. He was helping him personally recover. Do you have failure in your life? Have you, do you have sin in your life? Do you know the Lord wants you to recover personally? And your life is not over. Your service for the Lord is not over because last, I can be confident that Jesus is willing to reassign me into ministry. He said, I've prayed for thee, thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. I have a ministry for you, Simon. Not only are you, you're going to fail me, but I've prayed for you. I prayed that your faith wouldn't fail. And when thou art converted, you will be converted. I know this already. Just like I know you're going to fail me, I know you're going to be converted. And I have a ministry for you. I want you to strengthen your brethren. Have you failed the Lord? Take confidence in this. He's praying for you. He loves you. He can restore you personally. And he's going to reassign you to a new ministry. You may forfeit some ministry, but he has a ministry for you. Thank you for tuning in to Faith Connection where we help you connect to God.